टेक्स्ट 102 चूरी करी राधा के नील गोपी गणे रे अन्यापेक्ष हैले प्रेमे रढ़ता न स्फूरे नॉट विजिबल ओके फाइन ओके लेट्स स्प्लिट इट फर्स्ट चूरी करे राधा के नील गोपी गणेर डरे अन्यापेक्षा हैले प्रेमेर गाढ़ता न स्पूरे चूरी करी राधा के नील गोपी गणेर डरे अन्यापेक्षा हैले प्रेमेर गाढ़ता न स्पूरे
the verse kaam sharir api was 106 in this chapter will be quoted from the geeta govinda of jaydev goswami ओम ज्ञानतिरंध्य ज्ञानाजनिशलाखा चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति भक्तिवेदातस्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिशतारिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैतगदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hey Krishna. So we continue our discussion on the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism and its distinctive contributions. So, so till now I discussed about how Krishna has intimate loving exchanges with his devotees and Krishna conceals his godhood. And yesterday I discussed about how Radha and Krishna are ultimately the same person manifesting as two. So today and tomorrow I'll talk about two distinctive aspects of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. which will conclude the series today i'll talk about parkiras and tomorrow i'll talk about love in separation so <clears throat> earlier we discussed about how the question may come up if krishna never comes under illusion then how does yoga maya bring krishna under illusion so the rasdila section begins that chapter 29 chapter begins with yoga maya upashita ha that the lord took shelter of yoga maya he saw the beautiful autumn atmosphere and he desired to perform loving pastimes with the gopis and for that purpose he took shelter of yoga maya now the whole bhagavatam describes the various tattvas that take shelter of the supreme tattva that is krishna so krishna is the ashray everything is the ashrita but that same bhagavatam is describing then that that same that supreme ashray he he took ashray of something else <coughs> so how does this happen so if we consider krishna leela to be like a drama this study mentioned the drama is not in the sense of unreality it is the supreme reality but drama in the sense that it is all enacted for the reciprocation of love for the uh, performance of loving exchanges so in this case we could say that krishna is like the central actor in the drama and all the rajivasis are like other actors and yoga maya is like the director so that actors no matter how talented they are the actors are often much more well known than the directors where in in hollywood or wherever else the actors are who are visible but the actors act as per the direction of the director the actor says do this do this and then the whole drama or the movie goes forward and the actors they told by the directors that their creativity is to enact it all so in that sense uh, when krishna said the bhagavatam says that yoga maya upashita krishna took shelter of yoga maya what does that mean yoga maya is like the director krishna is like the actor and krishna wanted to est- and have loving reciprocations with his gopis and so uh, he took shelter of yoga maya he entered into that role that he is kishor kishor krishna he is a teenage he is a teenager he is a youth the young boy and the gopis are young girls and in that mood they started performing pastimes so when krishna enters into that mood that entrance into that mood is by the arrangement of yoga maya now <clears throat> as i mentioned that when krishna is running away from mother yashoda in fear he is actually fearful he is not just acting he is fearful 
Of course, he can come out of that fear whenever he wants. That is his supremacy, but he is fearful. So how is this? Krishna is the actor, Yogamaya is the director. But then the director also does not direct independently. The director directs as per a script, which is written by a script writer. So often the whole movie uh, or whole drama begins with a script written by the script writer. So now it's interesting that for Krishna Leela, if you consider it to be a drama, Krishna is the actor, Yogamaya is the director, but the script writer is Krishna himself. So that means Krishna is simultaneously in control and not in control. Because it is everything, the whole direction is happening by his script. So in that sense he's in control. But when he is acting the role according to the script, at that time he he so much enters into that role that he temporarily forgets that he is God. That forgetfulness is not because of ignorance, that forgetfulness is because of transcendence. Ignorance means one doesn't know. Transcendence means one knows something higher. Just like there is darkness because of which, uh, if there is complete darkness, we don't see the clouds. That's this darkness, that's ignorance. But when there is a sun, and because of that brightness, we don't see the clouds, that is transcendence. So it's Krishna and the Vrajivasis, it's not that they are ignorant, they are transcendent. So, in the Gachendra's prayer, there is a concept called Parat Paratattva. Paratattva is Brahman. But the para is transcendental. So, <clears throat> this material world is there. Beyond that is the Brahma Jyoti. But Bhagavan, the Supreme Lord is <coughs> described there as Parat Paratattva. The tran Prabhupada translates there as transcendental to transcendence. So, from the material perspective, the spiritual level of reality, Brahman is transcendence. But the personal reciprocation of the Lord with his devotees, they are transcendental to transcendence. They are at a level where knowledge is there, but there is something more than knowledge. More than knowledge which enables a devotee to relish Krishna Prem. So Sammandha Gyan, it is said, is like the star. You know, like if somebody is trying to travel, then if there is a pole star there in the ocean. Okay, this is the north, so I should go like this. So Sammandha Gyan, knowledge about our relationship with Krishna. Jivera Swarup Hoi Krishna Nitya Das. A jiva is the servant of Krishna. The Sammandha Gyan is like the star which guides the soul from the material world to the spiritual world. And without the star, one will not be able to navigate the path. So for us as sadhakas, the Sammandha Gyan is very important. We are eternally the servants of Krishna. For the Vrajavasis, that mood of service is deeply internalized. And along with that, there is something much more. That is their intense affection. So that when the sun rises, the star is still there in the sky, but it is no longer seen. So for the Vrajavasis, by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, they don't know that Krishna is God. They're not consciously aware. And Krishna himself is not consciously aware. That is by Yoga Maya. So this is Krishna being in control and not being in control by being the actor who forgets and being the script writer according to whom the script moves. That is... Krishna exhibiting achintya bheda bhed in terms of Leela. Achintya bheda bhed is simultaneous oneness and difference. Simultaneously Krishna is in control and Krishna is not in control. So <clears throat> everything in the spiritual world is arranged for enhancing the loving reciprocations between Krishna and his devotees. So that means the whole spiritual world is a dramatic setting. Like earlier we discussed about uh, Natya Shastra involves uh, proper stimuli being given in a dramatic setting so that a particular emotion is created. The whole spiritual world is a setting arranged for the intensification of loving reciprocation between Krishna and his devotees. So this means that actually Whatever is present in this world is present there also. Now, is time present in the spiritual world or not? No. At one level, we could say, uh, in the Brahma Samhita, it says, that even a, as much as a, the time required for the blinking of an eyelid, that much time doesn't pass in the spiritual world. But then, we also have, that, and at night, Krishna called the gopis, and there is a whole 
there are there is in the books like Govinda Lila Amrit, there's description which pastime Krishna performs at what time. And those who are on the Raga Marga, very advanced devotees, they meditate on those pastimes at that time. So Krishna is performing pastimes with the with his parents earlier in the morning. Mother Yashoda wakes him, bathes him, dresses him. So devotees in the morning meditate on that pastime. Then in the afternoon, Krishna goes out with the gopas. They meditate on the gopas' pastimes. So the point I'm making is not the meditation, but the distribution. There is clearly time in the spiritual world, in the sense that Krishna does different things at different times. But the, if we consider how Krishna defines time in the Bhagavad Gita, Kalosmi Loka Kshay Krut Pravrut. He says, 11.32, he says, Time I am the destroyer of the three worlds. So Krishna, he, time of course creates, maintains, destroys. All these three phases of change happen through time. But Krishna defines time at that particular context in the Bhagavad Gita because the war going on and Arjuna is concerned whether he, who will win, whether his party will win or the other party will win. Krishna says, time I am, the destroyer of the worlds. So the defining characteristic of time, we could say, is destruction. And that is absent in the spiritual world. So nobody dies in the spiritual world. Nothing gets destroyed. It's not that Govardhan, this world may become smaller, but Govardhan, the spiritual world, eternally stays the same size. So, <coughs> in that sense, <coughs> time is present, but time is also a servant of Krishna. Time is not the controller or the destroyer. So it is not that when Krishna is performing pastimes with the gopis, you know, Krishna is looking at the watch, oh, now I have to go to my job, we have to end the meeting. No, when Krishna wants to perform pastimes with the gopis, when he's performing Ras Lila, he, because time is under his control, he can expand time. And one night can become as long as the night of Brahma. So time also exists in the spiritual world for the purpose of enhancing the loving reciprocations, for intensifying the sweetness of the pastimes. How time relates with separation that we will talk later tomorrow. But whatever is present in the material world, it is there in the spiritual world. The sun is there, the moon is there, but there is no dependence on them. Krishna can be self-effulgent, the gopas can be self-effulgent. So there is no dependence. Although there is, the presence is there, there is no dependence. There are also old people in the spiritual world. Nanda Maharaj and Nashwada Maya are a little elderly. So they, when he meets Nanda Maharaj, one of the things he says for the first time, he says, you know, you are quite advanced in age, and we had thought that by this age you would not be able to have a child. But it's fortunate that the Lord has blessed you and you have got a child. <coughs> so there are elderly gopas also in the spiritual world. Elderly gopis also there. But they don't grow older further. They're eternally of that same age. So Radha Krishna are eternally of the youth age. So basically, there is, in a sense, whatever we are present, what is present in this material world is there in the spiritual world also, in its pure form. And for a pure purpose. Pure purpose is, it is all for enhancing the loving reciprocation between Krishna and his devotees. So, Krishna, in the Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi, Jara is, uh, Vyadhi is disease. Disease is another characteristic of the material world. There is no disease in the spiritual world. But, when Krishna wants to reciprocate love with his devotees, he may manifest a headache. That is simply for intensifying the loving reciprocation. The, <coughs> the Ishopanishad says that the absolute truth does not have, has, does not have any veins. Aparega chukram akayama vranam ashnaviram shuddham apapaviddham So, uh, there is, it is said over there, that avra <coughs> ashnaviram shuddham Ashnavi, uh, actually, this doesn't have veins. But then, when Bhishma is shooting arrows at Krishna, the tears are coming out, sorry, no, blood is coming out. How is blood coming out? It is simply for enhancing the love. So if we consider the, the issue of itself, before it has said, Akayam. That Akaya can be literally translated, it doesn't have a body. Kaya is body. But then it also says, Avra, Ashnagram, Shuddham, Apapavit. That there are no veins also. Now if you obviously don't have body, then you won't have veins. So why tell that specifically again? So Prabhupada very insightfully translates akayam over there, not as without body, 
But Prabhupada translates as unembodied. The soul is separate and soul gets a body. Soul is embodied. But unembodied is not the same as disembodied. Unembodied, disembodied means somebody had a body but the body was taken away from them. But unembodied means they did not have a material body. So, Krishna has a spiritual body. And in that spiritual body, Krishna does whatever is required for the reciprocation of love. And with this setting, now we can understand, let's look at what is the significance of Parakiras. <clears throat> and this was, there's the word Dari. That Krishna, when he was with the other gopis, he felt apprehensive about expressing his affection for Radharani especially. And that's why he took Radharani away separately. So, um, normally there are some things which we discuss if it's very close, intimate dealings. Now we don't, either intimate uh, discussions, intimate emotions, we don't exhibit them in public. They're very close, very private. And that privacy brings intensity to it. So the whole idea is Krishna wanted to have intimate exchanges with, with Radharani. And thus, he took, he took her away from the other gopis. So similarly, there is the intensive, whatever is required for the intensification of love between Krishna and the gopis, between the Krishna and his devotees, that is there. In the spiritual world, especially in Goloka Vrindavan. So, <clears throat> there is, in, in the, the, uh, our acharyas have talked about how Krishna and the gopis relate in Parakiras. So Swakiras is where is Krishna is married to the queens. The queens belong to him. This happens in Dwarka. Rukmini, Satyabhama, they are all married to Krishna. But in Vrindavan, there is Parakiras. Parakiras means, means Krishna and the gopis are, sorry, Krishna, Radharani and the gopis are not married to Krishna. So, uh, now there, is, there are different levels of explanation for this. And it's a very limited subject, but let's understand the philosophy basically. As I said, the whole purpose of everything in the spiritual world is the intensification of love. So Krishna can feel the maximum love for the gopis and the gopis can feel maximum love for Krishna. So now, the, uh, the arrangement of Parakiras is simply for the intensification of love. So, sometimes people say, how can God be immoral? Now, Prabhupada gave different answers at different times. You know, how could Krishna have so many queens? Prabhupada said, if he is God, he is the greatest. So, uh, if he is lusty, then he is supremely lusty. So, of course, Krishna is free from lust. But Prabhupada was emphasizing the point that everything is found in its supremacy in Krishna. So, the point is, from the philosophical perspective, all living beings belong to Krishna. So even the gopis belong to Krishna. So in that sense, from the tattva, from the philosophy point of view, Krishna's relationship with everyone is swakya. Krishna's relationship with even the gopis to him is not married. It's also swakya. Because they all are his. All living beings are his. So even the gopis belong to him. Mamai vam sho jiva loki. All living beings are his parts. So from the philosophical point of view, Krishna's relationship with the gopis are pure. Because all living beings belong to him. Now, going, I started with the example of a drama. Say, there is a family, is a husband and a wife, who are happily married to each other in real life. But then, they participate in a drama. And in that drama, the wife and the husband, they're not married to each other. So the wife, she is maybe having a relationship, uh, she's married to someone else, or uh, engaged to be married to someone else. And this husband is not is also not married. Basically, not they're not married. So actually, in real life, they're married. But in the drama, that's being an actor, they're not married. Now there is. Prabhupada used the example of the upside down banyan tree, and he says that in the reflection, whatever is at the bottom, is at the top, in the reality. So a mango which is at the bottom in the reflection, that means it will be at the top. So like that, what might seem immoral in the material world, it is at a very low level of morality, it's immoral. That actually at the spiritual level is supremely moral. 
it is the highest so so now in this world we see that when a boy and a girl they will have to have a relationship with each other once they get married they start taking each other for granted and they are always there and the love often wanes of course there are other reasons also they start to see the negative side in the love wanes but the maximum intensity of love is when the relationship is being formed when they just meet each other they just eager when is the next time we are going to go on date when are we going to court and there is so much eagerness over there so when a relationship is just being formed it has not been formalized at that time the intensity of the mutual attraction is the maximum and further whenever there is obstacle you know that oh you know my parents are not allowing me to meet you or my parents are not allowing me the boy says or the girl says like that then they hide and they meet each other so the opposition increases the excitement you know we we'll meet over here we we'll do this we have to do that we have to do that so now this of course often leads to immorality in the material world but the point is when there is a, the relationship is not yet formal the intensity is much more and the excitement associated with the relationship is much more so in the spiritual world it is arranged in such a way that uh, in the lila sense although krishna and gopis are eternally swakhiya but for the sake of lila for the sake of intensifying their attraction for increasing the excitement in their mutual dealings it is arranged that krishna and the gopis they are not married to each other and then whenever they want to meet each other then there is so much excitement now in fact it is it is also said that radharani is married to another gopa who is abhimanyu abhimanyu this abhimanyu is different from arjuna's son abhimanyu he is a different person but now who is abhimanyu if we consider from lila's perspective abhimanyu is actually an expansion of krishna's shadow so and abhimanyu never touches radharani so there is abhimanyu sister and his mother jatila and kutila and they are constantly obstructing radharani from coming to meet krishna now the whole purpose of this is simply to intensify the excitement now as they say there's a elephant and that elephant is young and it is growing so when the elephant is growing at that time you know maybe the baby elephant was tied to a pole and it tried to pull it couldn't couldn't break the pole but as it grows up it starts realizing it it its strength is increasing and say nearby there is the baby the elephant is the elephant has become grown up and then nearby there is some delicious food and the elephant wants to go there now the food is directly available then when the elephant will just eat it but if the food is not available then the elephant will pull and stretch and then as it stretches it says hey the tree is bending the tree is bending and tree is breaking so the elephant will like, oh my I, i didn't know i had such strength and the master also says oh i didn't know this elephant had become so strong so what happens when there is opposition for the elephant then in that opposition there is internal realization of one strength and there is external expression of one strength so the elephant comes to know i am so strong and others also come know oh, how strong the elephant is so similarly in the relationship of krishna with the gopis the the setting of the parkiras is arranged in such a way that the obstacles are created for their meeting for their performing pastimes and when the gopis they overcome those obstacles and despite all those obstacles they come to krishna then what is happening by this by this there is that the they themselves come to know how intense their love is for krishna and the world comes to know how glorious is the love so the setting of the parkiras is simply to enhance the intensity of the love so from the philosophical perspective it is swakhiya from the lila perspective it is parakhiya for the sake of enhancing the excitement the intensity now having said this our acharyas are also very careful they explain at different levels 
so that there is no even impression that Krishna is immoral. And this is done at various levels. So first of all, when, when Krishna is performing pastimes with the gopis, the Rasala pastime is going on, at that time Parishit Maharaj notices that some of the kings are uncomfortable. And some of the sages around him are uncomfortable. Therefore he himself asks you know, that this Krishna, he is maintained to establish dharma. So how could, he, how could he do something like this? So Shukdeva Goswami answers at different levels. One answer he gives is, that he says that the supremacy of the Lord means that he is superior to moral principles. That means, see, morality is below Krishna. Morality is not above Krishna. If anything would be above Krishna, then that would be God. So in principle, if God is supreme, that means God is above morality. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sri Thakur gives the example that when it's dark, at that time we may need a lamp. We may need a torch or a lamp by which we can find our path and walk forwards. But if it's daytime, the sun is there, then we don't need a torch because the sun itself is giving so much light. So he says that the lamp is like the principles of morality that we human beings are meant to follow. These principles ensure that we follow the right path. The moral principles that are there, they ensure that we don't succumb to our selfish desires, we don't succumb to our sinful desires, and they keep us on the right path. However, these moral principles which are like a lamp. They are no longer needed when the sun of Krishna rises. So Krishna, so we need moral principles because we have selfish desires, we have sinful desires. And with this selfish sinful desires, we often tend to get misled. Now Krishna has no, no sinful desires, he's completely pure. So in that sense, Krishna does not need any moral principles. The Bhagavata also uses the argument that by chanting Krishna's names, people become free from lust. And that is something which all of us experience to lesser or greater extents. So then the Bhagavatam says, how is it possible that Krishna himself, who purifies people of lust, can ever act out of lust? So Krishna, when he's interacting with the gopis, it is not out of lust. Now sometimes the word karma is used. But the word karma is simply used to indicate the intensity of the attraction. It is not used to talk about the selfish lust that is there in this world. It is used simply to indicate the intensity of the attraction. Now, apart from this also, our Acharya described that actually the relationship was not immoral because the gopis, they desired to have Krishna as their husband. And for that purpose, they performed Katyani Puja. And at that time, Krishna, he, when they were bathing in the, um, in the Jamuna, Krishna accepted them all as his wives. Adhrachar has also described that when the Brahma Vimohan Leela was going on, at that time, you know, Krishna had expanded on all the Gopas. And then the Prajavasis, the Yoga Maya, she came and she said that now it is time, Purnamasi, she came and said, now it is time, you know, this, they're all, it's time for their marriage. So all the Gopis were married to the various Gopas. And all these Gopas were actually Krishna. So in that sense, Krishna, when he was performing, Krishna, performing Lila with the Gopis, he had always already married to them. And not only that, further, um, <coughs> it is in the Bhandiravan, there is a place where Krishna and Radharani get married. Brahmaji himself comes and performs marriage. So, uh, not only that, Jiva Goswami in the Gopal Champu describes elaborately how Krishna after he goes to, goes to Varka, comes back to Vrindavan. And when he comes back to Vrindavan, he marries all the gopis. And he describes that when the gopis are married apparently to the other gopas, he says that just as in the case of uh, Sita, when Sita was abducted, it was actually by Ravana, Sita was not abducted. It was an uh, image of Sita, a Maya Sita was abducted. And the pure Sita was untouched. So like that, Jiva Goswami uh, quotes various shastras and describes that actually there were two sets of gopis. And 
the gopis who lived in their husbands uh, 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 houses they were actually the maya gopis and the real gopis were completely pure and they were married to krishna when krishna came back to from uh, dwarka to vrindavan so the point of uh, discussing all this is that actually there is no immorality there is immoral there is moral and there is transmoral there is transcendental morality so when krishna and gopis they perform their leela is being performed it is transmoral it is at the level of the highest purity because they are all acting simply out of pure love selfless love so krishna is god but he hides it godhood so that his devotees can love him and so that he can love his devotees the gopis they know krishna is god but that knowledge goes in the foreground and they think we have to do whatever it takes to serve krishna now the if we look at the five rasas the word madhurya shri prabhupad translates it as conjugal and bhakti sadan sathakur would translate it as amorous the amorous affairs of krishna with the gopis now the word conjugal refers to the status of relationships when there is a legally wedded couple conjugal relationship that means a relationship between husband and wife the word amorous refers to relationships which are centered on lo- loving attraction but often there is no connotation of marriage over there it's just attraction between male and female so <clears throat> if we consider the gopis Their, their relationship with krishna in terms of tatva as a swakiya so shri shila prabhupad is focusing on translating madhurya as conjugal he is focusing on tatva the gopis are actually eternally married to krishna in the sense that they are all eternally his parts all living beings belong to him so even the gopis also belong to him and when the priest acharya is translated as say amorous bhakti sanskrit thakur is focusing on the lila there actually in terms of lila krishna and the gopis they are not married to each other and that is simply meant to enhance the excitement of the pastimes and this way when the gopis they eager to meet krishna they longing to meet krishna they never take each other for granted because krishna and gopis are not always together so every time when they meet is such enthusiasm such anticipation such excitement uh, and when, uh, the whole setting if you understand that the in the spiritual world it is not god who reigns supreme in the spiritual world especially in golok vrindavan it is love that reigns supreme it is not god that reigns supreme nor is it morality that reigns supreme it is love that reigns supreme and for the sake of love krishna subordinates his divinity and krishna subordinates even ordinary morality but just as krishna always remains god krishna is always supreme and whatever krishna does is always moral it is not immoral but it appears in some cases as if it is immoral now in the tradition in the bhakti tradition if we consider these past times or say for example prabhupad is quoting here he is saying that later on geeta govinda will be quoted now geeta govinda is a very esoteric book at one level which describes uh, how krishna he is in agony in separation from radha and eventually how the two of them meet each other so in the tradition geeta govinda it has been chanted it has been recited and it is cherished as a exalted work of devotion uh, why is that is it that people did not have so the whole plot of plot line of govinda geeta govinda is that you know krishna radharani are supposed to meet at a particular place but at that time krishna is meeting some other gopi and when radharani comes to know about that she gets very angry and then when krishna comes to meet radharani radharani is so angry that she refuses to meet him the whole geeta govinda is about how krishna persuades radharani and he wins her over so now if you consider this past time this has been sung by the greatest of saints and sages jayadev goswami himself was a great saint and after chaitanya mahaprabhu cherished it so if if this were immoral why would 
uh, these great saints compose such literature or cherish such literature. So at the very least, before somebody criticizes the Parkiras as immoral, you know, one can just be open-minded. Things are not just as they appear to be. I'll conclude with a simple example of how the understanding of the tattva is essential before understanding of the Leela. Understanding of the position is vital before understanding of the action of the pastime. So, now if some person who has lived in a village and that person, or, or a tribe, and that person doesn't know anything about surgery, doesn't know anything about any artif anything, uh, uh, how are the bodies operated and treated, and that person comes to a, a hospital, and the operation theater, he finds that, you know, he just comes there and he sees, this doctor takes out a knife and starts cutting. He starts cutting. Hey, what are you doing? You're killing this person. You're hurting this person. He starts screaming. He starts screaming. And, and all that, shut up, just be quiet. And then, after the surgery gets over, he's cut up the patient and he tells the relatives of the patient, you know, he's cutting him up. He says, be quiet. And then the relatives, what do they do? Instead of, instead of punishing the doctor, they pay the doctor. And they say, what is this? He cut up your relative, you're paying him. He said, actually, what is happening? You know, the uninformed person cannot understand what the doctor is doing. So if the, if the position, the doctor, the surgeon is meant to treat and heal and is trained to treat and heal, and that training, treating and healing requires cutting. So if one doesn't understand that, then one can judge and one can completely misunderstand. So like that, you know, there are skeptical people who talk about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis, and they say, hey, this is immoral, this is immoral. You know, how can you people worship such an immoral god? But, you see that there are greatest saints, and they, none of them ever consider Krishna to be immoral. Rather, they worship Krishna, they offer their homage to Krishna, and not only they offer their homage to Krishna, by offering their worship to Krishna, they actually become more and more moral. They become, the, already the pure souls worship Krishna and those who worship Krishna also become pure. So therefore, actually in the past time there is no immorality. It is transmoral. But to understand Krishna's transcendental position, to understand the transcendental past times of Krishna and the gopis, one has to philosophically understand his position. And that's why in the Bhagavad Gita also it says, Janma karma chame divyam evam yo vetti tattvataha. That one has to understand in tattva, in truth. So when we understand the philosophical background in which Parkiras is enacted, when we see that the whole Parkiras is meant simply for magnifying the love, for intensifying the love, for enhancing the sweetness of the pastimes. And as in the spiritual world, love reigns supreme, in Golok Prindan specifically. And for the sake of love, when God subordinates his godhood, and morality is also subordinated. But God always remains God, and morality always remains true. And this is the extraordinary nature of the pastimes of Krishna with the gopis. Bhaktivinoda Thakur has written a book on a small essay on the Bhagavat. And in that he analyzes much of what I spoke today was based on my understanding of his analysis. So he had to present the Bhagavatam to people at that time. And people were just, already the Western Christian missionaries were saying, oh, you Hindus, your God is so immoral. And there were Indians also saying, yes, yes, Krishna is immoral. The Krishna of Kurukshetra is good. Okay, Krishna, who is the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, is a great philosopher. This Krishna of Vrindavan, you know, he's the immoral character. But actually, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains how this is the highest. And Prabhupada was once asked that, no, please tell about Ras Dila. So Prabhupada said, first Kurukshetra Lila, then Ras Dila. Kurukshetra Lila means Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita over there. We understand the Bhagavad Gita. We understand the position of Krishna. And then only we can understand the Ras Dila. Of course, the Ras Dila is a very elevated topic. And at one level, we can say we should not discuss it only. That is true. We cannot discuss the confidential aspects of it. But the fact is, if we 
don't understand it, if we are not able to explain it, people are going to get some understanding of the, of the other of it. And most likely, their understanding is going to be a misunderstanding. So, we cannot understand it enough to be able to relish the intimate exchanges in those pastimes. But we can and we need to understand it enough so that at least we can help those who have got some misunderstanding. So that we can at least explain how it is not immoral, how it is transcendental. And at different times, different uh, reasonings can be used. So Prabhupada in the uh, Krishna book says that actually Krishna was just uh, eight years old. So an eight year old boy never has any lust. So there is nothing mundane about this pastime. So there are different reasonings that can be used, but the point is we need to be equipped. This is the highest pastime, and when people misunderstand it to be immoral. At one level we have to say that to understand the specifics, we all need to become purified. But to understand the overall principle, we need to have enough understanding by which we can explain, we can ourselves be convinced, and we can explain to others how this is actually sublime, supremely sublime. It is an exhibition of pure love in an abode where love reigns supreme. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about how here uh, in, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the relationship between Krishna and the gopis is in Parakiras. And what is the purpose of, or how do we understand this Parakiras? So I talked about the spiritual world. Everything is arranged for the enhancement of loving reciprocation between Krishna and his devotees. So the spiritual world is like a drama, in which Krishna is the central character, uh, Yogama is the director, and again Krishna is the script writer. So Krishna is in control, and Krishna is not in control. It is again for the purpose of enhancing the Leela. Because it's Leela which happens according to Krishna's will, so Krishna is the script writer, he's in control. But because Krishna wants to relish the Leela, so he wants to absorb himself in it, so then he, he forgets. So in that sense, he's not in control. So the whole, it's, it's a drama, not in the sense that it is unreal, but drama in the sense that it is, the setting is made for intensifying the emotional effect and the emotional reciprocations. So time, in the sense of being a controller or destroyer, is not present in the spiritual world. But time, as a means for having variegatedness, as a tool for having different pastimes at different times, in different environments. Time as a servant of Krishna is present in the spiritual world. Similarly, disease is not present in the spiritual world. Old age is not present in the spiritual world. But it's not present in the sense that it doesn't debilitate. But if for a particular pastime, Krishna has to manifest a headache, he will manifest. And if for having a particular kind of relationship, certain gopas need to be old, they, gopas or gopis, they will be old. But there's no debility because of that. And same way with, if you consider this purpose of enhancing the sweetness of love, then Krishna arranges his parakiras. So in tattva, in philosophy, because all living beings belong to Krishna, so even the gopis belong to Krishna. But in terms of leela, you know, when a relationship is not formal, then the excitement, the intensity, the anticipation is much more. And what is often leading to immorality in this world, which is like at the bottom of the uh, the mango at the bottom in a reflection, that is at the highest in the in the reality. So that which appears immoral in this world, that is supremely moral, that is transmoral, because it that demonstrates how the devotees are ready to give up everything for Krishna's sake. So the, dev so, uh, the gopis, they give up even moral fetters, apparently, to come to Krishna. And that is their selfless love for him. So the setting in which, okay, apparently Radharani is married to someone else, and there are her in-laws who stop her from meeting Krishna, it's all meant to enhance the excitement, enhance the sweetness. So it's like Krishna and Radharani, they are a married couple, but in a drama, they're acting as if they're not married, and they're having a relationship. It's in tattva, if you understand, there's nothing immoral. And in Leela also, actually, our Acharya has explained it is not immoral. Because we have four explanations, and there are many others also which our Acharya has given. One is that Krishna was, when the gopis worshipped Krishna, gopis worshipped Katyayana to get Krishna as their husband. Krishna fulfilled their desire and accepted them as their husbands. Then when Krishna, in the Brahma Vimohan Leela, when Krishna was, it had expanded all the, all the gopas, at that time, 
Krishna married all of them. Mm, all the gopis. So in that sense, he's their husband. And Gopal Chipu described that Krishna actually was came back to Vrindavan after being in Dwarka and he married all the gopis. So he, and of course, what Prabhupada says is Krishna at that time was just seven years old, so there was no lust. So within the Leela also, how there's no immorality is explained by Racharyas. But why at all the setting is there? It is there to intensify the reciprocation of love. And then I, uh, just as when there's opposition, elephant realizes the strength internally and expresses it externally like that. The opposition to the love between Krishna and gopis demonstrates for themselves and for the world the glory, the intensity of their love. And I concluded by talking about how tattva needs to be understood before Leela. So a surgeon may be misunderstood as a murderer by an ignorant person. And similarly, Krishna may be thought of as immoral by some people. But the greatest saints, they worship Krishna. And not only they worship Krishna as supremely moral, but by worshipping him, they themselves become moral. So, at the very least, uh, an open-minded person will not dismiss it as immoral or questionable. So there's something deeper over here which I need to understand. And if they really become open to understand, then they will slowly start appreciating how this is, this is profound, this is a sublime exhibition of the highest love. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any comments, questions? Yes, please. When Krishna comes, he has his wonderful childhood pastimes, and then he has his pastimes with the cowherd boys, and then parakya. You mentioned that in the spiritual, Krishna and Radharani, they're eternally this Youthful, age. Yeah. Now, do, is there any youthful pastimes and pastimes okay, with yeah, the cowherd boys? So, are in this, if in the spiritual world, Krishna is eternally youthful, then are there the Bal Leela? Is this, does he have a relationship with, as a child with the Gopas, with his mother or with the other Gopas? In the Anandadnavan Champu, and a very beautiful explanation of this is given, that it is just as Krishna is the source of all the Vishnus, so similarly, he says that Kishore Krishna, Kishore is the youthful Krishna, is the source of all the other manifestations of Krishna also. So the Krishna has, among the higher rasas, three main rasas. There is the Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya. And he's, uh, it is described that there is the Bala Rupa, there is the Pauganda Rupa, and there is the Kishore Rupa. Bala Rupa is below five. Pauganda Rupa is between five to ten, roughly. And Kishore is beyond that, around 15. So now it is described that the Kishore Rupa is the Madhurya Rasa Vigraha. That it is, it is when somebody is at the age of 15, 16, 17, that is when there is amorous relationship possible. So that is the Madhurya Rasa Vigraha. And when a person is, when a person is very small, below the age of five, that is when the reciprocation of the parents are the most. So the Bala Rupa is the, um, is the Vatsalya Rasa Vigraha. The form that is especially suited for Vatsalya Rasa. And so the child is very small, the child doesn't know anyone except the parents. And the parents are everything to the child. But as the child starts growing up, the child, as if after child, five, six, child, child starts going out of home, then the child wants to spend time with friends. And the parents come back, say, come back from playing. No, let me play a little bit more. The parents are there, but the friends are the real thing in a person's life at that time. So the, the, so the Pauganda, the Pauganda, five to, age, uh, five to ten year age, that is the Sakya Rasa Ashraya, or Sakya Rasa Vigraha. So that means there are these three ages of Krishna, which are especially suited for particular Rasas. Now, eternally in the spiritual world, Krishna is in the um, is in the Kishore Rupa. So, because the prominent mood of the spiritual world is Madhurya, of Golokrindana and Madhurya Ras. But, so Anandamjit who describes, Kavi Karnapur says that, when Krishna is performing relationship with a particular devotee, that same Krishna manifests the form appropriate for that. So, from the Kishore Krishna, uh, from the Kishore Rupa of Krishna, when Krishna is performing pastimes with the Gopas, the Pauganda Rupa manifests. So when Krishna is performing pastimes with the Gopas, he 
it appears to them as if they're just eight, nine, ten years old. They are nothing else in the world except their friends. And Krishna is performing pastimes with the with Mother Ishoda and Nanda Maharaj. At that time, to him, although he is Kishore Krishna, he appears as if he is Bala Krishna. He is Bala Rupa. And that's why it is described you know, many times in the Bhagavatam, we will see that even Krishna has grown up. You know, Krishna, he has just killed Kamsa and he comes and meets Devaki. And he meets Devaki, what happens? It is described that from Devaki's breast, milk started coming out in affection for Krishna. Now Krishna is already at least 10 years old. Now 10 years, the milk doesn't stay in a woman's breast. But that, that's not, it's not physical or biological. The milk is a representation of the mother's love for the child. So in the Leela setting of the spiritual world, whatever is required for the intensification of the Leela, that is done. So Krishna manifests the, the Bala Rupa when he is reciprocating love with his parents and those who are in the Vatsalivas. Krishna, Kishore Krishna, who is eternally Kishore, he manifests as the Pauganda Rupa when he is interacting with Sakhas. And when he is interacting with the gopis, he manifests the Kishore Rupa. So all the relationships are there and the appropriate forms and moods are also there. So the Balila is also there, but the whole chronological sense of the pastimes, uh, in the sense that Krishna was a baby and then Krishna grew up and then Krishna did this, that is not there in the spiritual world. Krishna is eternally youthful, but all the devotees, uh, he reciprocates with them in a mellow that is suitable for their fulfillment. Um, thank you for your class. You gave a really uh, poetic and nice, very um, powerful analogy when you were, you were mentioning the importance of Sambandha Gyan. And you mentioned like stars guiding us in the sky to where we, we go. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned how one at the perfectional stage, like just like the gopis, it's like the sun rising and then the stars are still there but they're not so visible. Can, can you talk more about that one? Can you can explain that okay, analogy yeah. more? So I said that Sammanda Gyan is like the star and Gopi's love for Krishna is like the sun. So, can I elaborate that? Yes, if you consider one of the Gopi Gita. And the fourth verse of the Gopi Gita is Nakhalu Gopi Ka Nanda No Bhavan Akhil Dehi Naam Antaratmadra Vikhana Sarthito Vishwa Guptaye Sakha Udeyi Vaan Satvatam Kule So, every single verse of the Gopi Gita, the underlying mood is Krishna, come back. Krishna, please come back. You disappeared from our vision. Please reappear in this vision. Re reappear before us. So in this verse they are saying, now we understand Krishna. Nakhalu Gopika Nanda No Bhavan. Now we understand that you are not Gopika Nandan. You are not Yashuda Nandan. Now we are thinking that you are just one of our guys, but you are not. In the previous verses, it is said that how Krishna, you saved us from so many demons, from Indra and from Yoma and so many other demons. So they say, how could you have done this? Because you are not Gopika Nandan. And who are you? Vikhana Sarthito No, you are Akhila Dehi Naam Antaratma Drek You are the indwelling seer in the hearts of all living beings. That is the super soul is present, is Vishnu himself is present in the heart. Then, then if he's in the heart, what is he doing outside over here? Vikhana Sarthito Vishwa Gupta Ye he is Vikhanas. Vikhanas is Brahmaji. And Brahmaji is distressed and he besieged the Lord. Vishwa Gupta Ye, therefore, for protecting this world, for protecting the universe from the demons, you have descended. Sakha Udeyi Vaan Satvatam Kule. Satvatam Kule. Sat the dynasty of Krishna is known by various different names. One of, it's, sometimes it's called Yadu dynasty, sometimes it's called Satvata dynasty. So because of the prayers of Brahma, you are manifested in the Satvata dynasty. But the important point is that in so many ways describing how you are the supreme, you are the indwelling super soul, you are the one whom Brahma prayed to, 
you have decided to you have descended satputra dynasty but let's say what are they saying sakha sakha means oh friend so all that knowledge is there that krishna is god but the intimacy of their love is so much that the gopis they in a later verse they say pani fanar pitam te padambujam krna kuche shuna krundi ruchayam they say with your feet you have actually crushed kaliya they know that past time and yet the same gopis are saying shila trunankurai sida titina kalila tamana kanta gachati this is when we think that your feet are being pierced by the thorns the pebbles the brambles on the paths of vrindavan our heart is ripped apart by that so now if krishna has survived in the fangs of kaliya now his teeth are far more venomous and dangerous than some some small thorns and the gopis know that krishna has crushed kaliya but still their love for krishna is so great their desire to serve him is so great and although that acknowledgement is there yes krishna you crushed kaliya but no your pain your your legs will be pierced by the thorns and that will cause you pain and we can't tolerate that krishna please come back so there is a awareness that krishna is god so the acharya has described that this particular prayer na khalu gopika the gopis turn it around he says that you are the indwelling super soul of all living beings at one level you could say that he is supreme he is transcendental but this is if you are the super soul of all living beings then you are in our hearts also then you will know how distressed we are therefore seeing our distress please come back he says and for the vishva gupta you descended to this world to protect this universe and we are also part of this universe and we are in mortal agony so please come back please come back so that means and they say him he is who is he sakha you are our friend oh sakha please come back so there is the knowledge that krishna is supreme but that knowledge is just used to intensify their love that knowledge it it is not in the foreground of their awareness it is in the background of that awareness and they may refer to it in prayers but their focus is krishna is our lovable lord he is our he is a lovable friend and we just want to offer him our love so so that they they have the knowledge but that is not in the foreground there is a beautiful past time when krishna the same extension only and when krishna had uh, disappeared from the gopis then krishna took the form of vishnu and krishna took the form of vishnu and the gopis saw vishnu is also had the blue shin complexion so when the distance saw oh this is krishna and they started running towards him and when they saw it was vishnu you know, they became disappointed the yogis are elated when they get one darshan of vishnu but the gopis were disappointed on seeing vishnu and then they said asking vishnu where is krishna where is krishna and then vishnu pointed this way go this way and the gopis offered obeisances to vishnu and ran they offered obeisances and ran away from him and then finally last of them was radharani and radharani came and she begged oh vishnu where is krishna such was the intensity of her love such was the agony of her separation from krishna and then vishnu he tried to point with his hands that way but the intensity of krishna's love of adharani's love for krishna caused vishnu's two hands to disappear and he was pointing but there were no hands to point and then what happened Radha, radharani saw her beloved lord in front of her so even when vishnu is in front of them they know vishnu is god but they are not interested in vishnu they are interested in krishna so this this past time through a uh, event demonstrates what also happens in terms of the knowledge of the gopis they know krishna is god but that is not in the foreground that krishna is our lovable friend he is our lover that's what is in the foreground of their awareness okay thank you Thank you Prabhu. You were talking about the 
effect of time in the spiritual world as compared to effect of time in the material world. And it just got me thinking about specifically your example of Govardhan Hill. Um, how, how does time affect the Holy Dom in the material world? Because as far as I've understood is that the, everything, even the Dom in the material world is directly under the control of Srimati Radharani or okay. another divine personality, not Mahamaya. So okay. um, how, how does time affect the uh, okay. the 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 dom in the material world like Govardhan Hill sinking yeah. and things like that. So how does time affect, say, the dham in the material world? When Krishna manifests in any way in the material world, those manifestations have a particular purpose. The manifestation's purpose is to give an opportunity for us to remember, to serve, to practice bhakti and to develop bhakti. The purpose of those manifestations is not to prove their transcendence to the faithless. The purpose of those manifestations is not to prove their divinity or their supremacy. It's like when we consider the deities. Is Krishna himself manifesting as the deity? And Prabhupada will say that those who see this as Krishna with the other eyes, this will be revealed that this is Krishna. But then we see also in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and in much of the history of India, there are many invaders who came and desecrated the deities. So, if Krishna is God, why, did, why, how could the deities be desecrated? The deity is Krishna, but the deity is not manifested to demonstrate his omnipotence. So we see that when the, there's any threat to the deities, often the de devotees don't ask the deities, you protect us. Rather, the devotees say, we will protect the deities. And from Vrindavan, many of the devotees, in very adventurous ways, took the deities to Jaipur, which was a Rajput king, which is more devoted king, Dharmic king. So the point is, the manifestations of the Lord in this world are not meant to demonstrate their transcendence to material laws. They are meant to elevate our consciousness by giving us an opportunity for remembrance and service. So if somebody tries to test those manifestations for their transcendence of material laws, then they are misunderstanding them. So the same what applies to the deities. So yes, we, if the deities are made of marble and then we expose them to water, then the marble may get eroded. Krishna is not going to get eroded. But Krishna as deity is not manifested to demonstrate the transcendence. Krishna is manifested to give us the opportunity for service. So if we keep that purpose clear, so when the dham manifests in the material world, at the material level, if there is mismanagement, if there is adharma, if there is uncleanness, you know, at the material level, these things may happen. The transcendence of the dham is unaffected. But the transcendence can be accessed only by transcendental vision. And that's why Bhakti Nath Thakur in the Navadip Dham Mahatmya says that, that the dhams like Navadvipa or Vrindavan, they are covered by an avaran of maya. They are covered by an avaran, by a covering of yoga maya by which ordinary people cannot perceive these dhams. And it's only those who become purified, or at least those who have the desire for service, they, they have service attitude, they will be able to perceive. So yes, now specifically for Govardhan sink, decreasing in size, there are particular uh, pastime which are there, stories which explain that. But I'll not get into the specifics of the pastime. The principle is that the dham manifests in this world and in its spiritual potency, the dham is unaffected by any changes that may happen at the material level. But in its material appearance, then whatever is the way people are acting over there, that will have its effect. But that is only for the material appearance, that is not for the transcendental substance. So we may, if we just look only at the material appearance, then we will not appreciate the dham at all, if the appearance doesn't seem attractive. But that's why we need to go to the dham in the association of devotees, who reveal, us, reveal to us the spiritual essence, the spiritual substance of the dham. And generally, when there is hearing, there is intellectual comprehension. Then there, and there is prayerful contemplation. 
First we philosophically understand and then there is prayerful contemplation. Then there is devotional revelation. And when the devotional revelation happens, then what the dham specially is, that is revealed. So when we hear, that is intellectually we comprehend. And then there is intellectual comprehension plus devotional, plus prayerful contemplation will lead to the divine revelation. And then we will understand how even amidst the, amidst whatever materially problematic things are there, the dham still remains pure and potent. Thank you very much. Chaitanya Charitamrit ki, Shla Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Chaitanya Gaur Premandi. Let's go Chaitanya Charana Prabhu ki jai. So we'll conclude with the final class on appreciating Gaudi Vaishnavism tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.